Okay. So, um, yeah, you can all kind of mute yourselves. And then if you have any questions or anything, put them in the chat. But we'll have time at the end to chat. I, I shouldn't be talking for too long, let's hope. <laughs> and uh, I, I will certainly take questions, as I said. So, you know, we've covered this a little bit now already, but the first six months of 1921 were by far the most violent period of the Irish War of Independence. And February, of course, saw an almost daily barrage of raids and reprisals. There were several large ambushes that month, some of which were successful for the IRA, um, although one became known as the IRA's worst defeat. There was another daring prison escape, this time for Ernie O'Malley and two other prisoners. And of course, the Irish diplomats were keeping up the pressure for recognition of the Irish Republic abroad and trying to increase trade in particular as one of the things that would help allow the, the new country to flourish. So violence started on the first day of the month and demonstrated the brutality of the war, which was now being displayed by both sides. The IRA ambushed an RIC country, County Inspector King near Mallow. They succeeded in wounding him, but they killed his 30 year old wife. So in retaliation, Black and Tans and Auxiliaries shot and killed three railroad workers at Mallow. Uh, one was only 17 years of age. The other was the father of eight children. So these kind of indiscriminate, you know, killing of, of civilians um, was kind of occurring more and more. On the 2nd of February, the IRA ambushed a four-man RIC patrol in League in Cork. And we'll see, like, Monster was certainly the, the hotbed of activity uh, in this six-month period. Daniel O'Driscoll, who was the IRA leader and happened to be from Abidornian County Kerry, he was going to be shot by British forces in April. He simply shouted, fire, let them have it, boys. And Constable Patrick O'Connor, a 22-year-old World War I Navy veteran from Mayo, who was now um, a constable in the RIC, was killed while another constable was wounded. So that feature of the war was really the increasing desperation on both sides. Civilians were shot, spies or suspected spies uncovered everywhere, soldiers were deserting or committing suicide. The war was becoming harder on the forces. As the British deployed more troops and resources to the south, the character of the conflict began to change. And we said it was the same in Dublin. You know, the Dublin IRA had kind of very active 100 men units, and there was increasing martial law up there too. The British now were using aerial reconnaissance and mounted huge drives of thousands of troops across the countryside. They also began to deploy small active service platoons to hunt the flying columns, who of course were scattered throughout the countryside. Terror rippled out into the civilian population. Basically, hardly any civilians had been shot as informers by the IRA prior to 1921. But in the first six months of that year, they killed at least 180. And I talked a little bit about that last week. Uh, you know, there's this kind of theory that a lot of them were Protestants. That it was sort of a, an excuse on behalf of the IRA to get rid of Anglo-Irish. But in fact, no, most of them who were shot were Catholic. So while no part of Ireland, of course, was peaceful, uh, outside of Munster, really, there was only isolated pockets of very intense guerrilla activity. And one of those would be in Longford. Sean McCohen's Longford unit carried out a successful ambush of auxiliaries at Clan Finn. Uh, he was uh, arrested later, um, an activity there kind of slackened off in his absence. So in 1921, Longford was the second smallest of the 32 counties uh, in terms of population, Carlo was below it. Marie Coleman in her book County Longford and the Irish Revolution said that Longford happened to be one of the most important theatres of the Irish Revolution. During the War of Independence it was the only significant area of IRA outside of Munster. So throughout 1920 the IRA in Longford had carried out numerous attacks on various RIC barracks. Their best outcomes had been achieved in Ballymahan and Arva where both garrisons surrendered and they kind of took over a large quantity of arms and ammunition. Towards the end of 1920, the revenge tactics of the Black and Hands and the Auxiliaries resulted in the burning of Grenard and Ballinalee. And, and those events had a profound impact on uh, the IRA and the local population. So, you know, kind of hardening uh, people's attempts to support, you know, the IRA. So Sean McCohen was continuously plotting and planning for a kind of a large scale operation that would reinvigorate the movement and throw the enemy forces into disarray. So on the 2nd of February, he and his flying column seized the opportunity to assert their position as one of the leading active service units in the country. In November, 
he had gathered together about 20 of his best soldiers to form a full-time flying column. So these men were on the run for most of the time, you know, staying in safe houses, but also developing mines and bombs for use in ambushes or figuring out how to cut the road so that they would have to, the British troops would have to kind of stall. Uh, opportunities for attacks on military convoys were being explored and Plan Finn was suggested as a suitable location for an attack uh, because the Black and Tan forces moved regularly between Ballinilly and Longford on that road. Sean McCohen and Sean Duffy picked the ambush, position, ambush positions a day or two before the event and transported a mine uh, in a wheelbarrow the night before the ambush. So on that fateful morning, 21 men congregated in various friendly houses uh, in the nearby village Killeen and awaited instructions. Basically, the information they had indicated that the, either the RIC or the Tans would be travelling from Grenard towards Ballinalee at some time during the day, and that they could halt them by this landmine which they'd bury in the middle of the road, and then attack from either side and from the surrounding fields. They thought that the British would arrive any time after 11am, but morning passed and no sign of them. Nearby households provided the men with tea and refreshments and finally at about three o'clock the sound of lorries could be heard in the distance. The IRA eyes were focused on the position near the bridge where the mine was buried as two lorries carrying 19 auxiliaries approached. Paddy Callaghan detonated the mine with perfect timing and the first lorry was blown into the air with the occupants thrown out of the vehicle. The second lorry of course was forced to stop and the men got out and the fight began. The English had a Lewis machine gun, which was quickly brought into action, but the gunner was hit by fire and put out of action. And when a second auxiliary officer tried to man the gun, he met the same fate. So their most powerful weapon was kind of useless. A fierce battle ensued, uh, but the British were seriously exposed with very little cover on a bare roadside in the middle of winter. So in fact, the shootout only lasted for about 15 minutes and the auxiliary surrendered. Eventually the British commander indicated that they would, uh, he himself was mortally wounded and he wanted to speak to Sean McCohen. So they moved down to engage with the leader, um, who was Francis Worthington Craven. Craven inquired of Sean McCohen as to what he intended to do with his comrades, some of whom were already dead and many more who were injured. McCohen famously asked Craven, what would the outcome be if the positions were to be reversed? Uh, Craven's response were, is it as bad as that? So knew full well, you know, what they could have expected had the shoe been on the other foot. McOwen mercifully replied, no, it is not. And so he ordered his men to tend those who were injured and indicated that he would allow them the use of the undamaged lorry to take away those people for medical treatment. Craven, in fact, died at the site. He had been mortally wounded. And uh, in tending to the wounded, however, Sean McOwen was almost caught because he and three men were left on the roadway kind of, you know, wrapping everybody up and arranging the dead. British reinforcements arrived from the Ballinilly direction. Um, and so these men were forced to kind of beat a hasty retreat, even while they were under fire from the new arrivals. So four auxiliaries died in that ambush. Sorry, I've just decided to better check the waiting room. Yeah. Um, Sorry, guys in the waiting room, I forgot that there might be more people coming in. Um, so four auxiliaries died, uh, two at the scene and one later in hospital, a fourth a couple of days later. Later, Seven of the auxiliaries never served in the army again because of their injuries. None of the 21 IRA men who were injured in the battle, uh, oh, sorry, were injured in the battle, but Tom Brady did receive a superficial wound as he was retreating uh, from, the, uh, from the scene. Now reprisals of course naturally were expected in line with what occurred on every other occasion. Early the next morning in fa fact troops descended on North Longford and their first call was to the Clan Finn area where they took out their wrath on the houses closest to the ambush site. They shot dead an elderly man Michael Farrell who lived a few hundred yards away and tried to set fire to his house. Tom Duffy's house was nearest the ambush position and they tied Tom and his wife to chairs on the street and set their house ablaze. In Ahnacliff, they set fire to a pub and a grocery ran there and they arrested people who worked in there. Uh, another home in another town, Molly, was the target. Um, the man who owned that house, Paddy, had been in action at Clan Finn and 
had unfortunately discarded his rifle, which got damaged at the scene. And he had his initials engraved on the rifle. So the Black and Tans went straight to his home, ordered his father and mother out and burnt the house. Um, the considerable amount of guns and ammunition captured in this ambush, however, was a major boost to the morale of both the IRA and the people of North Longford, who had seen their towns looted and burned months earlier by the dreaded Thames. And so even despite the reprisals, the I IRA were seen by the vast majority of people in the area as heroes. And the event gave kind of momentum and encouragement to the IRA beyond the confines of County Longford. Sean McCohen's personal standing rocketed as a result of this well-planned and perfectly executed ambush. And he went on to become a long-standing um, politician in, the, in subsequent governments. Although he lied on his pension, it should be said, and, and claimed he killed more British than he had. <laughs> uh, so the next day, February 3rd, the East and Mid Limerick IRA ambushed a convoy of black and tans at Drumkeen in Limerick. And nine police ended up killed in this attack. Uh, two others were executed afterwards by Morris Mead, who was a World War I veteran. The IRA succeeded in getting 13 rifles and hundreds of rounds of ammunition. But of course, local houses were burnt in the reprisals. Now, the planning for this had gone back uh, to January. Um, Limerick had seen a fair amount of kind of activity and certainly they were close there to the border of Galway where those two brothers had been executed and kind of, you know, remember their corpses were mutilated. So uh, there had there was bad feeling, you know, in this part of the country. So Richard O'Connell, who was the commander of the Mid Limerick Flying Column, uh, began to plan an ambush of an RIC convoy, which was leaving the Palace Henry uh, RIC headquarters. They observed the activities for months. And they found that the first Thursday of every month, a, a convoy left with the payroll for the IR, RIC constables in Fedamore, which was about 11 miles away. And they seemed to use the same route each time and go on the same first Thursday. Of course, this predictability is a fatal flaw in a guerrilla war. And so they set the ambush for February 3rd. The flying column was under the overall command of Donnacha O'Hannigan of the East Limerick Brigade, who became a kind of legendary figure. Many have claimed credit for the idea of flying columns, but O'Hannigan apparently kind of did come up with the very first small flying column in the summer of 1920. And Michael Collins then pressed that organization uh, system, you know, uh, across the board. The East Limerick men were kind of waiting in Keelty. They met up with the Mid Limerick um, contingent near Drumkeen. And so this was about two columns uh, that numbered about 40. After a period of rainy weather, the skies were clear and scouts were sent out to discover if the convoy had departed. Around noon, the word came that two Crossley tenders had departed Fedamore at about nine o'clock and there was no unusual activity or any extra Crown forces in the area. Now, checking for this activity had become important because O'Connell, uh, who was a leader of the um, second flying column, had gotten a kind of a shock a few days before the ambush when a local farmer whose name was John English of all things said to him in the pub in Drumkeen I heard there was a crowd around my place a week ago because he lived very close to the ambush site looking around there and I'm told there's going to be an ambush now you know okay he asked the IRA guy but he could have just as easily gone to the black and tans with this information you know so O'Connell did his best to keep a poker face and he assured the farmer that there was nothing planned. They had switched their plans, uh, but they ended up, sorry, switching their plans from ambushing the convoy on the way out in the morning and they would hit them instead on the way back that afternoon. So this way they felt they could observe any planned counter attacks to the ambush and melt away unharmed if Crown forces were ready for them in the morning. Now this meant of course there'd be less daylight hours after the ambush uh, so, you know, that could help or hinder the column if they were attempting to escape the area. The ambush location was very well selected, though. I'll, I'll show you a photograph soon. There was stone walls along both sides of the road. Uh, halfway down the length, there was a cemetery with an old ruined church. So the men could hide, you know, in there and, and shoot across the road. So O'Hannigan spread his men along both sides of the road behind the walls and in several houses uh, up and down that road. And he set up barricades on where the road forked at the end of the ambush, set them up so that the driver couldn't see them until they came to an intersection. In addition to O'Hannigan, 
uh, there was about four other men with him in the ruined cottage. As they settled in to wait for the arrival of the convoy, they had to detain any civilians who came along to be sure that no word of the ambush got out. And sure enough, one of the civilians detained was the farmer, Mr. English, who discovered that O'Connell had lied to him and that not only that, they were going to use his farmhouse while they waited for the, the forces to arrive. Another civilian just that was kept by the IRA was a woman driving a donkey, which had a huge bag of flour. So they had her take shelter in the house and unharness the donkey and used the cart to try to block the road, you know, so another uh, thing that would slow down the British. They did not remove the sack of flour and this, of course, becomes a factor later on. So at about 2.30, the lookouts near Drumkeen House let them know that the lorries were coming. Uh, the plan was to let the lead lorry reach the barricade before they opened fire because they thought that the two lorries would be widely spaced. Now, they were closer together than expected and the men lining the road uh, opened fire first at the second lorry when it was near the ruins of the old church so that they couldn't kind of back back and reverse out of there. Michael Hennessy of the Kilfinan Company, uh, who was near one of the walls, said that he killed the driver of the second lorry on his first shot. Uh, that was a guy called Constable Sidney Millen. Millen must have had his foot on the brakes because the lorry almost immediately haunted in the middle of the road. So the sound of the firing on the second lorry caused the lead lorry to speed up. It turned to the left and seeing the barricades, the driver tried to turn to the right, but he was going too fast. So he ran into the wall and slammed into the donkey cart, which had the huge bag of flour on it. Um, so this flour kind of erupted into the air and that truck too came to a stop. Now, the cloud of flour uh, kind of helped to save the lives of two RIC men who were thrown clear of the cab because the visibility was bad. And those two men, even though they were RIC members, they were in civilian clothing. One was a constable, Cox, and the other one was direct District Inspector Swanson, who was in charge of the convoy, actually. So by the time the cloud of flour cleared, all the IRA could see was that two men in civilian clothes were running through the field. And given that Crown forces used civilian hostages in their lorries, O'Hannigan decided to, you know, not allow the men fire because he didn't want to kill a hostage. And so those two escaped. Um, the volunteers later on spoke of Sanson in particular with scorn because he abandoned his men. So the volunteer participants said the firing really went on just for a few minutes uh, because the RIC and Black and Tans could mount very little resistance. There was 11 left in the two lorries, three in the first and eight in the second were either dead or wounded. Of the three remaining in the first lorry, one was killed very quickly by rifle fire and several grenades. Um, the other two managed to get out and take cover, but they were also quickly hit. In the second lorry, two constables managed to get underneath it. They put up short resistance before both were hit uh, and you know they died. So the firing was really over in about 10 minutes. There was one volunteer casualty, Liam Hayes, who survived. He later became a general in the Free State Army. He had part of his left thumb and a finger shot off, probably by friendly fire. As the firing ended then, the volunteers came out from cover to collect the arms from the dead and wounded. Constables Arthur Pierce and Henry Smith were alive, but seriously wounded. And they were taken into the farmhouse of Mr. English. When the farmer saw O'Connell, he asked him snidely, can I give a drink of water to this man that is inside dying? Uh, O'Connell said the English that that man, English, refused to ever speak to him again, even though they were neighbours, because he lied to him about the ambush. The wounded men were asked if either of them were Catholic, and one of them was. So Father Nolan of the nearby village was brought to the house uh, to comfort the man who appeared to be dying. Two of the RIC cap constables were captured, and this is where it gets tricky, were either unhurt or had minor wounds. One was a guy called Samuel Adams and the other one was either William Doyle or Patrick Foody. The kind of records aren't clear. Now, some of the volunteers claimed that they had initially pretended to be dead and then were discovered to be alive. Uh, but either way, they were taken into custody and the men of the Middle and East Limerick Volunteer Brigades were faced with the moral dilemma that others were facing around the island for the next five months. The British forces had announced that volunteers who were captured with arms could be uh, executed. And we know like this was not a bluff. It had already been carried out since January. There is martial law across the country. So even, you know, civilians that were caught with a gun in some instances were killed. Um, on January 6th, 
representatives of the volunteer units from Cork, Tipperary and Limerick had met and sent in a list of suggestions regarding uh, basically how to prosecute the war going forward. And among them was this, that General HQ should issue a proclamation, basically in effect, in view of the enemy proclamation that our troops will be shot if found armed, the enemy will be similarly dealt with by our troops. Now they hadn't gotten an official response from Dublin yet, but in the minds of many volunteers, the execution of volunteer prisoners by the Crown called for the same in return. Tom Barry wrote later on, they had gone in the mire to destroy us and our nation and down after them, we had to go. Not everyone agreed. And so this East Limerick Battalion, O'Hannigan held a court martial with four other officers and the vote was 3-2 for execution of these two men that they had found. So now O'Hannigan had to pick someone to kill the two prisoners. He asked Morris Mead and Sean Stapleton to do it. Mead had served, imagine, in World War I with the Royal Irish Regiment and so was kind of well used to, you know, death and, and the horrors of war. He had been captured and later joined Roger Casement's Irish Brigade while a prisoner of war in Germany. After the war, he was court-martialed for that and sentenced to death by the British, but he was finally given a king's pardon. However, when he came back to Ireland, the RIC arrested him and turned him over to the Royal Irish Regiment, kind of claiming that they had to check out his pardon story and held him for a few months uh, where he kind of performed menial tasks and I suppose was treated as a traitor, you know, really. So he escaped from there and joined the East Limerick Volunteers as soon as he got home. So, you know, probably this man was hardened and was willing to do, you know, whatever it took. He had combat experience and was familiar with British Army weapons. So he was a highly valued member of this brigade and he had no problem, to be honest, um, assassinating or, or executing the soldier. In his witness statement taken 25 years later, Meade did not embellish the agonizing events. He said, I took my man down the road and shot him. Then I went down to see how Stapleton was getting on and found that he disliked the job and did not want to do it. So I talk, took his fellow over and executed him also. Meade told a story that earlier he had shot another black and tan who had put his hands up over his head to surrender but then began shooting again. So, you know, some of these men were certainly um, well capable of doing whatever, you know, they felt they needed to do. Now, one of the next kind of exciting, um, and again, another win for the IRA was the escape from prison on February 14th of Ernie O'Malley. We talked briefly last month about Ernie O'Malley because he was arrested for activity in Kilkenny. He was captured under um, a pseudonym, Bernard Stewart. So the authorities didn't realize who they now had in Dublin Castle. Uh, he was held, transferred to Kilmainham Jail, which was, you know, a, a fortress, 300-year-old institution controlled by the British military. The plan was to free him and Frank Teeling and Paddy Moran, both of whom had been members of the squad and had been active on Bloody Sunday, and Collins needed them freed because they were certain to be hanged. Um, Teeling had been arrested down on Mount Street and had taken part in the assassination of one of the Lieutenant Angluses. Uh, Anglis had been recalled from Russia to organize the intelligence group, the Cairo Gang in Dublin. Uh, Paddy Moran was a draper. He was arrested in his own shop in Black Rock five days after Bloody Sunday. He was taken to Arbor Hill Prison where he was identified by Major Carew who lived on Mount Street. Two other soldiers testified that Moran had been part of the group that raided 38 Upper Mount Street on Bloody Sunday. Now he hadn't. He had taken part in an execution that morning at the Gresham Hotel, um, but not the one on Mount Street. He wasn't there. He attended mass at eight o'clock in the morning in Black Rock and only later went and, and um, took part in the execution in the Gresham Hotel where they killed the wrong person. The, the informer that they had working on the desk sent them to room 22 when they were supposed to go to room 24. So this escape almost didn't happen. Even though they had friendly British soldiers, Privates Holland and Roper, who didn't fully lock their cell. They kind of left the, the padlock a little bit open and they were able to push the door and smuggled in a bolt cutters for them to use. So they actually attempted to escape on the night of the 13th and got as far as the yard, but they couldn't open the gate. The detachable handles from the bolt cutters had been put on the wrong way and there was not enough you know, leverage or torque. And so the bolt cutters broke. The men whispered to the IRA men who were waiting outside the wall for them 
and the guys tried to throw over a rope ladder but it got caught on one of the spikes on the roof and uh, or on the you know top of the wall so they were pulled and pulled but the rope snapped so they had no option on the night of the 13th except to go back to their cells so the following night, uh, given assurances by the British soldiers that they would cut the bolts on the gate themselves, they decided that they would go. Um, Ernie O'Malley and um, what's his name, Teeling, left first and called as they passed by, called into Paddy Moore and to tell him to come out. And Paddy decided not to go. Several witnesses had testified on his behalf that he was attending mass on the morning of Bloody Sunday. Um, that he had nowhere, you know, he was not near anywhere Upper Mount Street, which was true. And so he didn't want to jeopardize the people who had testified on his behalf. And he trusted that the evidence clearing him was overwhelming. So he refused to leave the cell. Ernie O'Malley then decided to free Simon Donnelly instead. Donnelly had only been in prison for four days, but he was well known to the authorities and was on a list of people suspected of murdering police. Um, so was, you know, highly likely to be kind of executed in the coming days. Uh, in an effort to help the men get away, Paddy Moore and sang very loudly in his cell so that the guards would come to him instead of, you know, checking out other corridors. It, it was a huge maze of a prison and they were all held on different corridors. So by the time Donnelly and O'Malley got out to the yard and crept over to the gate, the lock had been cut. All they had to do now was to get the bolt across, which was really rusty and very loud. So they had actually saved some butter from their meals and they were able to rub that on the lock and finally slid the bolt across. They gently opened the gate inch by inch and slipped outside. The three of them made their way down a back road, hiding, they were given guns outside by the party, you know, uh, and they, they weren't sure kind of where they were going. He says they passed close to Richmond Barracks and then walked along the canal. They were, they were nearly caught by a military patrol while trying to cross one of the canal bridges and they had to throw themselves down onto the banks while they waited for the patrol to pass. Then they caught a tram going into the city. Donnelly got off in Camden Street, O'Malley and Teeling got off in Hatesbury Street, and they went to the house of the Malones close by. They, these men were free, but Patrick Moran, unfortunately, was tried the very next day in City Hall for his part in the shootings on Mount Street. Uh, Moran had 17 people to verify his whereabouts, including a policeman, they all stated he was nowhere near the shootings. And even though a witness for the prosecution would not admit for certain that it was more and at the scene, he was found guilty and sentenced to death. He was transferred from Kilmainham to Mount Joy and was hanged on the 14th of March for his participation in the Bloody Sunday killings. He was buried in the prison yard in an unmarked grave and in unconsecrated ground. He had been tried, convicted and hanged for the wrong crime. Now the two men who helped them escape, Privates Roper and Holland, were members of the Welsh Regiment, reputed to have been Irish and possibly from Belfast. Roper had been in the service for seven years. Um, although other guards were investigated for their involvement in the escape, the authorities were quite certain of the guilt of these two men. And they, were, they had been on duty together for a month before the escape. So they were both court-martialed and imprisoned for eight years for their involvement in this escape. Now, the next day, the 15th of February, um, a disaster for the IRA that went horribly wrong, the Upton train ambush in Cork. Uh, three volunteers killed, two wounded, six British soldiers wounded, and six civilian passengers killed with 10 wounded in the crossfire. Um, so this was, you know, an absolute horrific thing. Uh, the train was in the middle of kind of the country, a uh, county on the arrival of the 915 train down from Cork. Maybe between 40 and 60 IRA men were lying in wait at the station because they believed a large contingent of British forces would be traveling on the train. The convoy of troops, however, had um, come by the connecting train from Kinsale and they did not go this far westward. So there was only about 20 military personnel on the 915 train and they were mixed in with ordinary civilian passengers. So there were three IRA ambushers uh, who had seven rifles um, and then the other ones had revolvers. The IRA arrived at the station 10 minutes before the train, imprisoning the station master. They cleared the station and they took cover behind sacks of grain and flour. The train was late and pulled in just before 10 a.m., was carrying a, about maybe, uh, you know, between 20 and 30 uh, British soldiers who were scattered throughout the train. 
two IRA scouts who were supposed to have signaled the, the British numbers never turned up. So Hurley did not know how many troops were on the train. He wrongly believed that the British troops were all in the central carriage. And so the IRA opened fire. There were heavy civilian casualties. The New York Times reported that a shower of bullets was rained on the train, practically every compartment being swept. Uh, now the soldiers returned fire from the train and Charlie Hurley saw that the enemy force outnumbered his own. He gave the order for withdrawal uh, told them to fall back and kind of head west of the station. Again, you know, this firefight only lasted for 10 minutes, but there were six dead civilians and 10 wounded. Um, three of the dead were railway employees, a signal man, a ticket checker and a porter. A civilian uh, victim was a commercial traveler who used that train regularly. Two of the badly injured were women, both from the city who were just on a kind of a day trip. Six British soldiers were injured and three of them seriously, but none of them died. Uh, two IRA volunteers were killed outright and another was fatally wounded. Two more were badly wounded, but survived. Charlie Hurley, who had led the ambush, was among the wounded. His own gun jammed after the first shot. And as he jumped down from the bridge, he received a bullet wound in the face and sprained his ankle. The IRA man, Tom Barry, wrote, all through some miracle, the nine unwounded and two wounded got away across country in small parties with the British following close behind. Three civilian passengers, one unwounded and two wounded, were detained by the British uh, on suspicion of belonging to the ambush party, which of course, you know, they hadn't. Now, on the 20th of February, the IRA suffered another massive defeat in Cork. Um, the Battle of Clan Malt was fought between the IRA and British soldiers from Victoria Barracks, which is now Collins Barracks in Cork City. The IRA, the IRA were part of the um, flying column of the 4th Battalion, 1st Cork Brigade. This flying column was based in East Cork and was led by Commandant Dermot O'Hurley. Uh, early in 1921, the flying column had moved together to use uh, an abandoned farmhouse at Gary Lawrence, which is near the village of Clonmult. This little farmhouse was you know, a long single story building with a thatched roof and no back door. And they were using this to live in for about a month before the ambush. A week prior to the battle, the column was ordered to attack a train carrying British military stores at Cove Junction railway station near Cork City. The commander decided to move the column nearer to Cove Junction and the move was to take place late on Sunday the, 20th, the 20th of February. Because they were about to fight in a battle, some of the volunteers decided to go to confession in nearby Dungurney on Saturday evening. And they were spotted kind of walking in a group coming back from the church uh, by a former British soldier. And so he reported their location to the British Army. At about lunchtime on the day of the battle, then the commander left the column to carry out recognizance of the area around Cove Junction. He took with him his vice commandant, Ahern, and the captain Paddy Whelan with him. So that left Captain Jack O'Connell in charge of the column. Um, uh, there was about, I think, 16 men with him and he told them to leave the farmhouse after dark that evening. Now, in the meantime, volunteer Dick Hegarty, who had gone home for the weekend, came back to the farmhouse and he brought these four kind of random young lads that he met with him. They had food and clothing and kind of refreshments uh, for the men in the house but they weren't you know, fully trained members. So the British informer went to Victoria Barracks on that Sunday morning and informed the British where the flying column was. Two Crossley tenders loaded with British soldiers from the Hampshire uh, Regiment and the informer left the barracks for Clanmalt. Now, of course, they didn't want to alert the men that they were coming. So the trucks were parked uh, about a mile away at a crossroads and the soldiers went on foot. The British officer in charge divided his troops into three groups left one group at the crossroads uh, to kind of you know prevent extra traffic coming in and the remainder he ordered to advance on the farmhouse from the north end and the south end even though there was no back door so effectively they were surrounded in the house now there was now 17 volunteers and these four youths you know uh, inside left in the house who were preparing to go out to to make the ambush they had put sentries on duty earlier on that morning but because they felt there was no danger, they had left their post and returned to the house. Uh, the abandonment of the sentry, of course, was to have catastrophic consequences because it meant that the British soldiers managed to get right up to the house without being seen. 
just as the soldiers under Lieutenant Kyo or Ko uh, approached the house, they found two volunteers outside filling water bottles at the pump. The two volunteers were immediately killed, and this, of course, let the volunteers inside know that they were surrounded. Captain O'Connell decided the men had no choice but to charge out of the house, but another officer, Captain Higgins, was against this and preferred to wait for assistance. So four men agreed to attempt to break out with their commander, but they went one by one. Jack O'Connell went first, and with the element of surprise in his favour, he actually got through the British cordon. Volunteer Hallahan went next, was shot dead at the door. Captain O'Hearn was shot trying to get over a ditch about 200 metres from the house. And the fourth man was Volunteer Hegarty, who was also killed outside the door. Another one tried, uh, Volunteer O'Leary. He got out of the house, but quickly returned inside. So then Lieutenant Coe sent one of the men to Middleton uh, in one of the tenders to get reinforcements. When he arrived at the RIC barracks, he found two truckloads of auxiliary police there. And this was more than enough, of course, reinforcements. They arrived back at the farmhouse. One of the British um, army officers threw petrol onto the thatched roof of the building and set it on fire. The volunteers inside now with Captain Higgins had, had to decide, were they going to surrender or burn to death? And so they decided to surrender. Um, the first one out was knocked to the ground by the auxiliaries. Paddy Higgins was next. And then you had a list of people uh, including, of course, some of these were brothers of the men who had been killed a little bit earlier. So David Desmond came out, his brother had died. The auxiliary police shot and killed all of them, except Paddy Higgins. He happened to be shot through the mouth, but the bullet lodged kind of between his teeth. And so the remaining few were coming out of the house. A British army officer stopped the auxiliaries from finishing off Paddy Higgins and prevented them from killing the remainder, which included three of those youths who weren't even in the column. So they took about seven men, I think, um, prisoner. The Battle of Clonmalt was over in a couple of hours, which uh, had cost the flying column 12 of their members and four members captured in addition to the four youths. The only one to escape was Captain O'Connell who ran out at the very start. The British soldiers collected the volunteers weapons and marched the prisoners to the trucks at the crossroads. The bodies were collected and left at the farmhouse overnight. The convoy made its way to Middleton RIC barracks and then back to Victoria in Cork City. British soldiers returned to the farmhouse on Monday and removed the bodies, which were handed over to their families the following Wednesday. James O'Hearn and James Glavin were taken to Cove and were buried in the Republican plot. The others were taken to Middleton, where all except Dick Hagerty were buried on the Thursday. So seven of the eight prisoners were court-martialed and all were found guilty of waging war against the king. Morris Moore, Patrick O'Sullivan and Dermot O'Leary were sentenced to death. Uh, and so Morris Moore and Patrick O'Sullivan were executed in the military detention barracks, uh, which is now Cork Prison, uh, in April of 1921. Paddy was court-martialed later, found guilty and sentenced to be shot, but he appealed his death sentence and then the truce came into effect in July, which kind of, or in June, which saved his life. The Battle of Clonmult uh, was the worst defeat suffered by the Irish Republican Army in kind of one, you know, episode. Uh, it just simply in terms of volunteers killed. So aside from all of the violence, of course, the Irish government were preoccupied with establishing diplomatic relations around the world. Um, and they had set up various cultural attaches across uh, Europe and America. They were particularly interested, we hear from Count Plunkett, in publishing the democratic program from 1918, you know, which was kind of this very um, progressive and inclusive document that the Labour Party more or less had put forward. Uh, and he wanted to publish that in, you know, the European languages. And they were dealing with the fallout from some of the Catholic Church members. I, I think we sort of mentioned it last month. Um, there was a Cardinal Byrne in England who had made scathing comments about Sinn Féin and the violence in England. Um, and, you know, even though Archbishop Mannix from Australia was doing a tour and trying to kind of get recognition for Irish independence. Um, so Art O'Brien, who was the London envoy of the first doll to, um, yeah, to London, wrote to De Valera that he had, quote, purposely brought in the matter of English intrigues at the Vatican. Copies of the letter, of his letter, were sent to all the foreign press correspondents and I have sent copies to our representatives in Paris and Rome. 
The letter was reproduced in the Independent, but they got some of the paragraphs transposed. A few days later, I sent a letter to the Times in reply to a long letter of Lord Denby's, and I had the same purpose in view. The Times did not publish the letter, but copies of it have been sent to all of the Catholic press, the foreign correspondents, in the same way as the first. So while violence was heating up um, massively across the country, the government were doing the very best they could to establish trade, uh, and certainly diplomatic relations, and to basically kind of go ahead with running the country, all, by the way, while not receiving the money from Dev's American trip. <laughs> so um, I'm just going to try to share my screen here so I can show you some of these, um, uh, some of these things that I wanted to show you. Oh, Lord. So does anyone have any questions while I look for share screen? Here it is. A huge one in green. <laughs> oh, you know what? I just want to um, make this a slideshow first. Okay. Oh, blast. Uh, share. So I'm just going to share my screen first so that you can see these. And then I'll check back to see if there's any... Um, So this was the ambush uh, of that um, first one that we talked about, McOwen's ambush. Um, so you can see, you know, on the way to Bernard and Ballin Lee, they were kind of right there. This was the successful one. Uh, here's the North Longford flying column. It's amazing, you know, to see these pictures, I have to say, uh, of some of the men. There's Sean McOwen. When he, you know, so around the time that he was commanding the flying column, and there he is later on. I, you know, I said he, I think he was minister for defense or something in one of the governments, but he certainly was involved in um, subsequent governments. And here's the the uh, monument to them, Oglig Naharan, um, defeated British troops. Now, this is the East Limerick flying column, uh, that second one, the Drum Keen one. And here's their. Uh, their commandant, Donica Hannigan and Dick O'Connell. And so this one had been, uh, you know, quite successful as well. Um, there's that ambush site. So we were saying, you know, it, it was perfectly placed because it was a straight road that you had the kind of wall with the churchyard on one side. And so this, they were well able to kind of control, you know, what happened here, uh, even with the donkey and the flower. So there's O'Hannigan. Uh, and that's basically what two RIC Crossley tenders would have looked like. I, I don't think it's the actual ones, but, you know, jam packed with men in there. So you can tell too, like, you know, if this one is blown up by a landmine, these boys don't have much, you know, chance really, like there's not a whole pile of um, shelter. So here's some of the, uh, the news. Morris Mead, I can't remember how you put him up there. I think he was one of the ones, you know, that was killed. Uh, this is some of the the footage that came out at the time from the press and all of these were heavily um heavily reported this is frank teeling around the time he escaped from kilmainham and there's ernie o'malley so his mugshot you know we said he had been arrested and claimed even under torture that he was bernard stewart so they had no information on whoever this bernard stewart guy was and did not realize that it was in fact ernie o'malley who they had been looking for you know for quite a while um that's paddy moore and the man who was killed there's, you know, one of the corridors in Kilmainham Jail that they would have had to go through. And again, some of this press. And, you know, we've said this before that the um, the IRA bulletin, you know, was very, the Irish bulletin was very successful in getting out all of this information, you know, whether they had had a successful raid or whether there was kind of terrible reprisals, you know, against civilians. That was a massively um, kind of uh, effective propaganda that they had in, in that paper. So they're denying that Francis Teeling escaped by means of a hoax because, you know, it was, there had been kind of collusion and they still don't know that it was Ernie O'Malley. Now this, I think is kind of sad. So this is um, a photograph of Paddy Morn and Thomas Whelan. There's Paddy Morn, taken the night before they were hanged. Uh, between them is the black and tan who managed to affect Morn's escape by making him exchange places with McGrath, who was serving a lighter sentence. So th this happens later on, I, I think in April when he's killed, the, he refused to go basically. And um, 
they could have kind of swapped him with another prisoner who you know you hope wouldn't have been killed but more and refused to leave the photograph was taken secretly and given to arthur griffith who was uh, in prison at the time as well so you know it's an interesting um again i'm kind of surprised they were able to take something like that here's the clan malt and which the scene of the house so they burnt you know the roof off this house and the men had no option but to come out there's some of the cork number one brigade and there's clan malt um train station this was the civilians you know, that were killed and then this is the cover on um well this is I, i'm going to say italian yeah not spanish that's italian and so they're saying, you know, the this is the Upton. Did I talk about Upton? I did. The train station at Upton. Sorry, not Clonmelt. Um, and so they're talking about, you know, the IRA basically had shot at them, but here's the soldiers shooting back. Um, now, and this is an interesting thing that has kind of come up a little bit, and I suppose as we go further into the war of the Civil War later on, this is where it gets sticky, I think, for Irish people. Most of these memorials that are put up around the country do not mention the dead civilians. And so, you know, you'll often see Oak Ligna Heron, or in this instance, they, they mentioned the, you know, three by name who died. Um, I think these are the men who died at the Upton uh, raid, no mention of the eight civilians. And so this is something that, you know, we might have to kind of think about later on. These are the men then from Camelot. I, I showed the house at the start. I should have moved it on. And I have a colorized photograph which actually names them. So six of these men were killed at that clan malt. And you can see how young they're like. These people look like they're, you know, 16 years of age. Some of them are a bit older, but, you know, I, I mean, we are talking about 22 and younger probably in the most cases. So this was taken, this is a colorized version during training. Michael Desmond, he and his brother were killed at Conmalt. Patrick Higgins, who was in charge. James, well, I don't know if they mean go back or go forth, but James Glavin was killed. Daniel Dennehy killed. Joseph O'Hearn, Richard Hagerty killed. Joseph Morrissey killed. Michael Hallahan killed. And then Staunton and Patrick White. So, you know, incredibly um, sad to think, you know, these young boys kind of, uh, going off and then again here's their monument in um uh, so like in the name of the irish republic they you know found their death they died on the 20th of february 1921 and uh it's all of the ira men who died and then this you know just to kind of bring us back this is a woman this was a different ambush now killeen but this is what it was like for the civilians you know having to deal with when IRA or RIC or auxiliary reprisals the next day would come in you know they were lucky to get their stuff out of their home and then the home was destroyed around them you know it must have brought back terrible memories of the evictions in the 19th century really and yet we said you know funnily enough it kind of hardens the heart of the um of the Irish contingent you know there's certainly no big push from civilians to uh, to stop, I would say, the war. So I'm just going to quickly check if anyone has any questions or comments. Um, do you guys have? <laughs> you can unmute yourselves now or, or do what you'd like. There's no comment on Facebook. OK, no questions. It's hard, well, I should say it's hard. Um, it is a little bit hard though to, to narrow down, hi Chris, to narrow down which ones to talk about because there is literally an episode every single day uh, of the month, you know, in, in most of these months. So I kind of chose the big ones and tried to give you, um, you know, some of them that were successful for the IRA and, and not successful, but there are, you know, there's soldiers killed crossing the street, there's civilians reprisals, there's, IRA people killing who they accuse of spies and um, you know there's random shootings by the RIC it, it was really you know an awful kind of time oh something in my wall just skirt, skittered <laughs> uh, so any questions or comments so these were basically 
uh, polarized groups, if I understand it, Elizabeth, that uh, had not only taken a position about, <clears throat> position about independence, but about uh, uh, pro-treaty. Is that correct? Oh, yeah, we haven't even come to that. You know, so at, the, at this stage, they're all fighting on the same side, the Irish are, you know, um, I mean, that's the, the heartbreaking thing is later on, they will split, you know, right down the middle. Thanks, Jean. And um, so right now, they're just, they're all united, trying to get the British out of the country. There are talks, Jack, now about, you know, peace. So we know for sure at this stage, like, De Valera has been in talks a little bit with them. Um, with Lloyd George and you know some of the, the priests around them have been in talks um but there's and you know for sure partition is a reality but I don't think that the Irish contingent are letting themselves think about that just yet and so you know the Northern Irish state exists by now um because it was formed under the government of Ireland Act in 1920 you know so they're going ahead with their own thing and I think the south is just the southern government is trying to win the war so that they can eventually you know co-opt them in but but they're not really thinking in terms of you know how difficult is that going to be if there's a state set up it's one thing to kind of convince six counties or nine counties because they don't know you know how many yet um to come in with you when they're under british rule but if they have their own thing are they going to want to give it up you know So it's about a year off where we're at chronologically in your presentation. Yes, exactly. So the War of Independence, uh, yeah, it's almost, I think like late November, you know, I mean, what's, De Valera walks out of the Dáil in January 22, after the, the treaty um, vote. So yeah, we're about a, a year off. And we're going to follow every month of it. <laughs> <laughs> It's going to be a long year. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? It's funny how localized the violence is too, isn't it? Like that Cork, you know, mm -hmm. you think about those men, they must have seen action after action after action because certainly Cork and Kerry and Limerick, you know, Munster was riddled with it. And some of those Limerick men are in and out of Tipperary, you know, or even Galway. So it, it, it has to have been very difficult. Like I, I liked, and you can see these in the Pension Bureau records, uh, no problem, Kendall. Um, you can see it in the pension records. Like I thought that man's testimony, like I just, I took my man down and shot him, you know, very matter of fact. Because a lot of them wouldn't have had that training or, or the background, you know, he, he fought in the war. So he had, you know, and, and I mean, he re was recruited out of a prisoner of war camp, but it's interesting. And again, given how young some of them are, like, I don't know what emotional toll, you know, this takes on them. Well, it's interesting when you take the uh, the idea of the guests of the nation, Frank O'Connor's yeah. story, and from what I heard you describe it is there was a, a, a um, IRA guy who was reluctant yet even to do in the British guy. So the yeah. feeling of the Irish people was not uh, much different, really, in terms of what Frank O'Connor was trying to pr project as, mm -hmm. as an imagery of, of the difficulties of war. Yeah. Oh, it's, and you know, it only gets worse maybe during civil war because how can you, you know, this is your previous comrade in arms or it's your next door neighbor or, you know, it, it must. And, you know, I, I think that it one of two things happens. Either you become even more reluctant to do it or you become so entrenched and so kind of horrified at what you would see as a betrayal, you know, whether that's pro-treaty or anti-treaty. I mean, some of these men were you know, hardcore enemies for life. Like it really does affect Irish politics, you know, not to mind. I, I think I've told the story before, you know, a neighbor or this older man that I knew from Castle Island, he was over 103 when he died. He had been a volunteer in the War of Independence. And he said, you know, he knew two neighbors in Kerry and Tralee that one would walk into the pub and the other one would walk out. And, you know, that was in the 1950s, 1960s, they still wouldn't speak to each other because of what happened at the time, you know. So it, it's incredible what it does to kind of communities and towns. Wasn't partition supposed to be temporary? Yes, it says John McNally. It was, John, sorry, there's a question on Facebook. So uh, initially, John, the, the intent was supposedly, you know, to make the state so small that it would be economically, you know, kind of in, unviable or inviable. And that didn't fully happen. Um, so 
obviously, you know, as, as things settle down and as um, the war of independence goes on. And then I think as, as the civil war goes on, you know, the North is perfectly happy and, and Ulster unionists are incredibly powerful. There's no need to kind of play with them anymore. And basically in 1925, the Boundary Commission, uh, who were supposed to be redrawing the map again to include, you know, different parts, uh, their findings get leaked and it would have taken parts of, you know, Donegal in, into the North and and so everyone agrees to just keep it at the 1921 boundary, which was only six of the nine counties. Um, but some of those counties had a, a had a very strong um, unionist, you know, majority. Jeff wants to know what was the total casualties for the IRA. It was about 1800, I think, um, Jeffrey. Not a whole chan not a whole pile but the majority of those deaths were in this six months in the first 1921 i i actually gave the exact um figures last month so i'd have to look those up again in my talk and john is saying is there a chance now for unity there is a chance now for unity um mainly i guess because what they predicted is kind of right you know the the six counties are not really economically viable on their own and they voted for instance to remain part of european union whereas england remained you know or voted for brexit so the north of ireland is caught in a very weird situation now where the the dup the party who are in control who are unionists and who are anti europe um are not really you know, representing the wishes of the majority of the people in the north. And so now there's talks of, you know, I, so for instance, like there is a border in the Irish Sea between all of Ireland, uh, metaphorical border, uh, between all of Ireland and England. And, and they're finding it very difficult at the moment, you know, to get some goods into the north of Ireland, out of Europe and vice versa. I, I read a, something in the paper lately that um, some of the delivery companies like are not making deliveries to the north of Ireland. It's, it's a strange, they're in a kind of a no man's land at the moment. We have a talk on Brexit on Thursday, which I think will answer those questions for you. I'm better at the history than I am the current affairs. <laughs> I don't get time to read newspapers. Uh, any other well, questions, Chris? Mm -hmm. Just add to just add what you said, and then the, the current situation gets so much more complicated because the EU had a misstep in the past week as well. They floated the idea of the EU imposing some sort of a border because they were afraid of EU vaccines getting up into Northern Ireland and then yeah, be a like backdoor a conduit to, to Britain. So the Irish government, you know, had to really step in and say, oh, wait a minute, this is what we've been fighting about for the last, you know, couple of years during Brexit. Now you're going to impose, you know, a border. Yeah. We can't do that. So, yeah. Oh, it's going to get, I think, even more complicated, to be honest. You know, I, I've read one of the major, like, pro-leave European things had to register their domain in the south of Ireland so that they would have a .eu thing instead of a .co.uk. So, like, it's, I mean, it's mind-boggling what's going on with Brexit, you know, but that'll be part of it. Um, have I answered all the questions on Facebook? I think I have. Mm-hmm. So that's it, you know, so I mean, this is, um, it's just going to be a litany for the next couple of months about, you know, certain kind of famous uh, battles, but also uh, what is fascinating to me, I think, is what's going on behind the scenes with the government, you know, this kind of nascent doll that they have, <laughs> excuse me. And so, um, you know, Michael Collins is doing Trojan work as the Minister for Finance, but also, you know, that they have set up actually a, a, an international diplomacy core is amazing, you know, really. Um, mm -hmm. And so they're operating under very, and I mean, all of these men are on the run, you know, they're often uh, arrested, sometimes, you know, they're in prison themselves. So it's very, very interesting how they're operating a government from being on the run. Is there any evidence as to what nations, now that you, you, you uh, uh, refer to that, as to what nations recognized uh, Ireland uh, diplomatically at that early stage in um, uh, 1920 or 20? 21. They have um, Russia, France, England, thanks Jim, and um, Russia, France, England, and America, they have diplomatic staff in them. Now, to what extent, I mean, you know, technically the, the consulate will say here in New York was being watched, you know, all the time. Um, they were spied on, you know, they were reported back to the British, but there was an element of, you know, let's just 
we would accept them. I don't think they were given, you know, the correct titles all the time, but they were allowed to operate out of an office, you know, but they, they certainly in New York, they were quite seriously spied on, <laughs> which is interesting. Um, and of course, that was only the consulate. They, you know, they had a crowd in, in Washington too, but they don't get high level recognition. So like earlier on, you know, Wilson had refused to meet with them. They don't get a seat at the table at, in the 1919 Treaty of Versailles talks. But they are allowed to operate. Russia actually gives them, or somehow they get some of the Russian um, crown jewels, which they don't give back until the 40s or 50s. That's an interesting, we'd we'll have to do a whole talk on that because I don't fully remember the story, but- yeah. um, Germany perhaps was recognizing them. Oh God, Germany did. Well, yeah, I mean, Germany just is in so much trouble itself, you know, by then, uh, but they did, you know, as early as 1916, they um, help, you know, Roger Casement to get, into the prisoner of war camps. They provide him with, you know, very bad boat and guns and things, but there, there was an effort on the part of the Germans initially to try to buoy up. And that's before independence even, you know, I think by the time 1921 comes around, Germany has enough of its own problems, you know. Uh, what do I, why do I think Cork and Munster was such a hotbed? You, you know, that's an interesting, I don't know is the short answer to that question. I suppose they had the means and the opportunity, like um, very easy to get down there and hide, you know, amongst the, the forests and the lakes. Um, you know, the, the Lestol, where I'm from, Lestol had one of the first mutinies. So the RIC themselves turned on their leaders when they were told, you know, that we're going to bring over this extra force. And so I think it's kind of opportunity in the one hand, but also there was terrible atrocities committed, you know, by the British forces. You had a lot of, like, again, the monster fusiliers, you had a lot of men in that area that had World War One kind of military experience. Um, but why it should have been more Republican than other provinces, I don't really know. I, I think it was just that they had the opportunity. You know, and they probably, like, no disrespect, some of the other areas were incredibly poor. Like, you know, if you're hungry, you're not going fighting, kind of, you know what I mean? Like, I, I sometimes think that that's the other side, but there, there was a lot of police, there was a lot of um, big farms, you know, they, they had multiple opportunities to kind of fight. But there are some very interesting books about that, John, um, you know, the, the fight in Munster and the War of Independence in Munster. So thanks everyone for coming out. And for those of you who came on Saturday to see Triscadia, I see Patricia and Aaron, I hope you had a good time. This is the, the miracle of Zoom. We hope we don't lose the year that the sound doesn't fade in or out or, you know, but um, hopefully you all heard it and thank you for tuning in. So we have our Brexit. I should have looked at my, my calendar. We've Brexit on Thursday and then next week, what have we next week? And Brexit is a weird time at 6.30. So just kind of, if you're coming to that, um, be aware of that. Then we have, uh, oh, I forget what we have. We have the mother and baby homes. I'm just not sure when it is. And we have two marking Black History Month. So we have me giving the, the history of Irish, of Black people in Ireland. And then we have, I think it's the 22nd, we have um, the Irish group, uh, Oh, black and Irish, and they're going to talk about, you know, their kind of efforts to politicize, I guess, and to publish, you know, the the um, uh, contributions of people of color, but also immigrants in Ireland. Um, so that will be very interesting. And then March is shock of luck. We are up to high dough for St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> so there'll be, I'll keep an eye out for those. Some talks, but also some musicians from Ireland and from here. And, uh, you know, we're looking forward to it all. Uh, we're going to have a, a baking demonstration because we can't do our soda bread this year. So Harold and Pat and I are going, well, I'm not going to bake. I'm going to taste it, <laughs> but we'll, be, we'll show you how to make the perfect soda bread. <laughs> um, so enjoy that. So thanks everyone for tuning in and enjoy the rest of your night. Thank, Thank you. you, Elizabeth. Take care. Thanks Stay so safe. Bye-bye.